Today, we're rolling up character concepts, and we're starting right now. I spend a lot of time on the internet in places where we discuss role-playing games. I'll bet many of you do too. Places like Reddit, Facebook, other discussion groups, you know, those kinds of places. Many of those questions revolve around character creation. Specifically, how can we come up with better concepts and how can we write more engaging backstories? I summed up my thoughts on what I think makes a character engaging here. Blam. I thought it would be useful to record my creative process as an example of some techniques you can use to go through the same process. Because I'm here to help. Want to know when I publish something useful? Subscribe and hit the bell icon to get notifications. And that still feels weird. Today, we are going to generate a set of random concepts. I have built a Google Sheet, link in the doobly-doo, that rolls randomly over a set of source data. This will provide us a starting point. Then, we will describe who that character might be and how we might play them at the table. And don't worry, these concepts should be system agnostic. With a little bit of work, they should drop right into whatever game you're playing. If the Google Sheet can help your game be a little bit more awesome, please feel free to use it. You are also free to use any of the concepts here for your own games, either player characters or non-player characters. If you do, drop us a comment below for how it went and what things you learned. Hopefully I have this set up correctly and you can see me, for better or worse, you can see my Google Sheet, which will be used to generate the concepts, and you can see a Google Doc, which we will record things in. The sheet up here on the top, this is where the output's going to go. This is the big button hit. It is a column for origin slash archetype. It's got a column for traits, flaws, although not all of these are flaws, motivations, twist, question mark, and name. A couple things worth noting are that there's overlap in some of these columns. That's intentional. Generally, it doesn't matter. Hopefully, we'll find something good. The twist may not apply to every character. Uh, some characters will be just the way that they come out. And sometimes we will ignore the twist because, again, this is a starting point. It's not, you know, we're not beholden to what's in the table. The names themselves are from fantasynamegenerator.com, which is one that I like. And I don't know. We'll put links to both of these things in the doobly-doo so you can take a look. I think what we're going to do is we're going to build a bunch of characters starting with Cronara and see how we like them. And if we see anything that we don't like, maybe make an adjustment and run some more. And we'll go for, I don't know, some time. Krenar is one of the ones that came up first as I was you know, testing the thing to make sure it worked. And I liked the, the results so much that I recorded them and we're going to talk about them now. So we have Krenara as the name. Origin archetype is servant, so she was probably a servant in a past life, maybe part of an estate or something. Uh, maybe a slave, hard to say. She's driven and she won't back down. And I like both of those things because they go in the same direction. And I think that can be very powerful. Her motivation is obscurity, and the twist question mark is against. So we're going to say that her motivation is against obscurity. So she comes from very humble, humble beginnings, and she wants to prove her worth in the world. So I think that all works. So I already like where this is going. We have a character who comes from very humble beginnings, and a character who is going to do their best to show their worth in the world. So we can imagine Krenar as sort of a Conan-like figure who starts with nothing and then ends up being very powerful. And you can see a very dark path that they could go down where they're looking for the next big challenge, and they're looking for the next big thing, and they, they're going to find it, and they're going to defeat it, whatever it is. So they'd be looking for things to do. Maybe they're looking for the next big duel to have. Maybe they're looking for the next big war to fight. I don't know. I think, depending on your campaign, this can fit in all kinds of different ways. I also like the, the idea that Krenar is not fighting against her own obscurity, but she's uh, fighting against the obscurity from, from other folks like her that share her background, where this is more of a humanitarian thing, where she's fighting for the servants, she's fighting for the people that don't have voices, she's fighting you know, more as a, like a folk hero or something like that. And so the really cool thing about this kind of... Uh, this kind of exercise is we start with this general set of ideas and we expand upon them. We have lots of directions we can go until we find one that we really like. Um, it's sort of an oracular, I don't know, read the bones kind of thing, which is pretty fun. So I'm going to write that up. You don't have to watch me do that and we'll go from there. Another thing I'd like to mention in case it's not obvious is we didn't say anything about class. We didn't say anything about race. We didn't say anything about really any of that stuff. What we have is her, her ideas and her beliefs and how we think they might fit together. Uh, which means if you're starting from something like this, you know, like right, your concept is um, more about their beliefs and more about the personality, you can get to a place that you can start fitting that stuff in. So uh, if we like the Conan-esque uh, direction, then we can imagine a Cronara that is uh, a fighter or a rogue or something like that. But I could also imagine the same Cronara as a, a sorceress or something. 
All right, so that last one was a little bit canned. I'd thought about that one before. I mean, just a little bit. So this one you're gonna get brand new, for better or worse. Here we go. Click button, go. Varadus, the urchin, he is stupid and stubborn, and his motivation is belonging and acceptance, and his twist is toward. So the twist is not a twist this time. I think this is also really interesting, and it's interesting how well they line up. So an urchin who is stupid and stubborn, those sort of all line up in the same direction. And wanting, belonging, acceptance. We end up with two very human kinds of, of characters here. So let's imagine this Varadis character who is, who's sort of, again, come from very humble beginnings and, you know, isn't super bright, probably wants to show that he has value, probably wants to show that there is a place in the world for him. And the first step of that is getting belonging and acceptance in some group. So if this is a player character, I think this is actually a really interesting player character who just wants to be part of a thing. So we see people like this in the world. We see them in history all the time. And uh, again, I think like the, the strength here is this is a very human kind of um, kind of story path. Some other sort of second level thoughts are how we might play this character at the table. So I think Varadis by himself is probably not a leader, and that's probably okay, but he's probably a very good sort of second in command or uh, a very good follower. And so I imagine he would find one of the player characters or one of the other NPCs in the world and try to latch onto them and try to try to do their best for this uh, this person. Because again, they want to be they want to be accepted. I could also see this being played as sort of sort of the grog, like dumb character kind of thing, where he knows he's not very bright, and he may, might take that very personally, and so goes out of his way to try to look smarter than he is. And, and you know, Travis plays this brilliantly in, in Critical Role, where Grog ends up being this very comical character most of the time. And I think that's great. So I, I think this character could be, could be that same kind of character. But again, we, we end up with, you know, we start with this random seed, and we go through this sort of thought process to build that character. And I'm going to go type it out again, and you don't have to watch me do that. The first two have been pretty good. Let's see if our streak continues. Oh man, oh my gosh. Every once in a while, like you do things randomly and you find just gold. And here we are, number three, also good. Uh, Drianna, the artisan, who is unrepentant, egotistical, and is motivated by recognition with a twist. So just off the top of my head, this character screams to me as someone who wants to show the world how great they can be. I've worked with a lot of these characters. And doesn't want to uh, they want to be recognized for their brilliance. They want to be recognized for their um, their special gifts or whatever that is. And they, they're unrepentant in that way. And again, these things all sort of line up in the same direction, which is weird, but it's good. It's great. Uh, what is the twist? So the twist can be done all kinds of different ways. And I think it would go to uh, whatever, whatever you felt um, worked best for that character. Just off the top of my head, starting as an artisan and showing this this egotistical wanting of recognition and then twisting that into you know maybe they were a sculptor or something and now they are a a magician and they're they want to be now recognized so maybe they were raised as a magician sorry raised as a uh, sculptor and then you know want to be known for something else or sort of the the artist of the family sort of groomed as an artist and then took up the sword and wanted to be a martial character after that uh, I think there are lots of ways that that can go that I think are, are phenomenally interesting. Taking another look at this character, other things that are coming to me are uh, the thing we said earlier about starting as an artist and then going off some other direction. Maybe they went off to war. Um, and the things I like to sort out are a big thing changed there. What was it? And you can imagine them being part of this college or part of this this is high society or something like that where you'd have sculptors or whatever whatever kind of artisan they are uh and then being being thrust into war and watching the people around them slaughtered and they get out for whatever reason and then they decide instead of doing this thing this artistic thing that they they feel really powerfully about go do this other thing instead and this is a way that they can show their greatness that that is not what they thought they were going to do um, but it sort of turned on a dime at this very very critical moment in their life and i think that's cool i think there's lots of really great stuff we can do here so i'm going to write that up again as a final thought for Adriana, as i was writing it but i realized i didn't talk too much about it i feel like she believes she was spared for some great thing maybe whatever period in her life that that went from being an artisan to being an adventurer whatever trauma traumatic thing happened there uh she was spared because there's greater things coming right she's 
part of some prophecy. She's part of some, I don't know what, uh, which fits into her egotistical nature. Uh, you can also imagine that she believes she is she was spared so that she could avenge these things and so sort, of, sort of go very directly toward whatever that is. Uh, I think there's a lot of options there as well. Uh, I think those all sort of play into the same set of ideas. Some of them very dark, which is, I don't know, sometimes really cool. All right, we are going to pull the one arm bandit. Let's see what happens. Oh, interesting. I tell you, this is working great. <clears throat> I swear to God, this is not scripted this way. So we have Jinnah, the survivor, survi uh, survivalist. He was courageous, condescending, and motivated by preventing calamity with a twist. So uh, again, these line up fairly well. I think to be, to be a survivalist, you have to be at least a little bit courageous. But then she's condescending. And why is she condescending? Because she's been through this all. Maybe she doesn't have any, any empathy for people who are having a rough time, who aren't used to that kind of thing. Whereas like a survivalist, someone who's been sort of out in the world and doing surviving i guess maybe she doesn't have the patience to deal with these folks these you know these city people that are having whatever trouble that there is in more generic senses try to prevent any kind of calamity that's coming and so probably like a you know a very gruff and short uh short tempered woods woodsland character that still wants to do the best so still probably believes that there's something great uh, and i think that's great because the, i think the twist is that we sort of expect these people to come in from the forest and be very friendly and she is not she she is not that character i think that's that's pretty cool all right so i've taken the liberty of like writing all that stuff up so there it is down there i would play jenna as a sort of create create uh, courageous but reluctant and abrasive hero who always does the right thing but you know, it's super hard to get along with. I want to say there's lots of these kinds of characters in, in modern media, and it might be really fun to play that character with an arc of, uh, of redemption where they start out like being very condescending to everybody and sort of being sort of the character caricature of, you know, the cantankerous woods person, uh, and then coming through an arc of acceptance and trying to figure out what, you know, what does it mean to be part of these these larger organizations, and what does it mean to, to you know maybe to have friends and you know learn that kind of stuff. I think again we've ended up in this very human place, which is just great. So for the next time, I hope we get something that's a little bit harder to work with because I feel like I'm not working very hard. This is all too easy. No, oh, we got the same name. We'll fix that in a sec. So Jenna, the survivor, survivalist who is merciful, a daredevil, and motivated, motivated by proving their worth as a twist with a twist. So as a survivalist uh, who is merciful. That's an interesting place to go. Maybe, you know, the, the mind leaps to being sort of a, a servant of the forest. Maybe they are, maybe they're vegetarian, which, you know, for me is crazy. Uh, but being a darede daredevil is, is really interesting. So I think, I think that by itself is already a twist where you expect them to be very peaceful. And instead they're like leaping off trees and, you know, maybe climbing, climbing open-handed across, you know, very, very dangerous kinds of places. Uh, and you imagine the same character being downplayed by society when they when they encounter society now they want to prove their worth to everybody so maybe the daredevil part is part of them trying to prove that they can do things because other people don't do those things normally uh, i think that's already pretty compelling so let me fix the name and we'll figure it out so now i've written all that stuff up i've changed her name from jenna to eliar and here are my thoughts after having written it all up and given it a little bit more thought i like the idea that eliar uh, yearns to prove her worth uh, to those that might shun her and to show that mercy is not a flaw, as I think a lot of people would see it as. And even though she's sort of been shunned by, you know, by civilized society, that she still wants to show that there's, you know, you can have, you can come from these places, you can do these things and be the, be this way and still be very, very useful to the world. And uh, I think that's cool. So the other thought I had, which would be fantastic if you could do it. Uh, because Eliar and Jenna have the same uh, origin and archetype, they could be sisters, they could be from the same community, and what would be really great in those kinds of places, so here we are back in author stance, and if you want to know about, more about that, play, play against each other uh, as a contrast, like they came from the same place, they have sort of some of the same leanings, but they're very different people, they're very different kinds of characters, uh, which I think would be great, that would be fantastic, sort of like from Critical Role, we see Vex and Vax, who are, you know, twins, but, you know, still pretty different, which is, I don't know, pretty cool. So part of me wonders, how many of these are we going to go before we find one that doesn't work? 
because I know that occasionally it doesn't work because I saw it when I was testing. Okay, so this is interesting. So we have Shenith, the servant, who is resourceful and stubborn and motivated by exploration and the twist is toward. So we're going to go toward those sets of, of ideas. So a servant, so again, we come up with a character with humble beginnings, maybe set out on their own, maybe thrown out, maybe they bought their freedom, I don't know. But they're resourceful, which is great. And as a servant being resourceful, I, th I feel like that would be a really, really useful thing. So they weren't just a take it and, and as it is kind of servant. They were uh, like, let's better the position. And maybe they were thrown out because they did too much. They overstepped their boundaries. And all of a sudden, the the people that ran the manor, the people that ran whatever, whoever those they were serving, um, had had enough of them. So, you know, get the heck out. Oh, which would be great. I can see them. I can see that same kind of person being stubborn without too much trouble, uh, and I think that all works together. And then, because they've li lived this very sheltered life in this, you know, as a servant, potentially from a very young age to to adulthood, they want to see the rest of the world. They they hear stories. Maybe it's the the people that are coming into the manor that are telling these these grand stories about magics and and creatures and whatever, and they just want to see all that stuff. So once they get their freedom, uh, they're sort of know, awaken to a larger world and off they go. That's pretty cool. So I've now written up all the stuff for Shenith and I had some other additional thoughts, which is pretty normal. We aren't spending all that much time with these characters. As you do, as you develop the ideas more, you'll have more and more ideas. Another way this could also go, not being a servant in a, in a manor, could be a servant in a, in a monastery or something like that. And their, their resourcefulness and stubbornness is probably, you know, more useful there. And Maybe they've always wanted to explore, but they didn't have the courage to do so. Maybe they get powers on the way because they're part of the monastery. I think that'd be pretty cool. Uh, maybe they're thrown out because they come of age and the the monastery won't keep them in these roles anymore. I think that works in, towards all kinds of different ideas. And I've played a lot of characters that are like this, sort of the, the cloistered youth who you know, had these very humble beginnings, but then ended up being a, a hero in the world and going off to do great things. I think this actually fits a lot of characters and has, uh, it's probably one of the less interesting ones that we've looked at, but still, I think, still think there's a lot of ideas that, that could be explored there. All right, so let's take another look, see what else we can come up with. Oh, oh boy, oh man. So going in the completely opposite direction, we have Vilmus, the noble, who is wary, egotistical, and wants to gain our, uh, honor, not our, off the top of my head, again, this, these all line up pretty well, surprisingly well. So it's not hard to, to, to imagine a noble, and one of the interesting problems we see with characters who are nobles is why are they out adventuring? So maybe this is a character that's been thrown out, maybe they've been ostracized, and they're wary because they're hunted. They're worried that someone will find out. Maybe they're trying to keep that a secret. I think that would also be great. Although I think that doesn't work out very well with being being egotistical. Uh, maybe they sort of downplay that until some dramatic moment where, where it all comes out and they realize, oh my gosh, no, this is Vincent Longborn, you know, whatever. Being motivated to gain honor also has a lot of really clever ideas. So if if this is a character who's sort of lost their inheritance, they've lost their, their hereditary titles because they've been ousted from power, they want to gain honor so they can come back and maybe avenge that, maybe come back to the place where they were. I think all of those are really interesting. In fact, you, there, there are characters from, from history that are very much like this. Um, so uh, again, random table. You know, I'm, this, none of this is scripted. This is what it is. So I think if I was playing this character... I would try to show sort of the two faces of his personality where he believes he's he's a noble. So he already has this sort of built in idea of how he's better than everybody else, which plays into the egotism, but then wants to gain honor and like probably knows those rules pretty well. So most of the time performs very honorably and does well and is, you know, a noble, you know, the the, the image of a noble knight, but in, in times of weakness, in times when things are, when he's unguarded, sort of the normal thing comes out, maybe if he's really drunk. Uh, I would, in fact, if I was working in author stance, I would look for places where I could do that. I'd give a little piece of this and then, you know, sort of try to backtrack that in play because I, I think that, that that would be just great. This is not the only way this character could go. You can go to all kinds of different directions, but this is the one that struck me first. So that's the one I wrote up. So there we go. So let's grab one more of these. Let's see if we can find a, uh, a really interesting one, hopefully, for the last one, but against random, you know, who knows what you're gonna get. Oh, we got the same name again. So we got Vratus, the rogue thief, 
We've got wary, frail, motivation has changed, and it's against. Interesting. Okay, so who is this character? So we, we know he's a rogue or a thief. Uh, so it comes from sort of the, the criminal underbelly, or we could also imagine Avratus, who is an urchin that's sort of grown up on the, the mean streets and ended up in this sort of weird place. So less of a criminal and more of sort of a marginalized character. And being frail um, sort of leans more towards the urchin route. So probably never, never got sufficient nutrition and ended up being in this bad place. So uh, for the motivation, change is actually really interesting, uh, although we want to we want to work in against that. So they want to go against change, uh, they, although I think the other direction is way more interesting. So actually, well, let's, let's ignore the twist for now and we'll say they want change. And I see this is going two very different directions. So you can imagine a change where uh, we want to help the people that are like us. We want to help help the urchins and set up orphanages and, and whatnot. And work more toward the betterment of everyone. You can also see a change where it's like the little people are going to rise up and, you know, take over the world and like go through revolution or go like build an army or build, you know, a movement that helps sort of uplift these folks to, to do things. So they're kind of going in the same direction, but very by different, very different means. And I think those kinds of, of subtleties can really help a character come alive. You can help, it can help give you some interesting nuances to work with. And I think those are all great. The thing I would look at for, look at for frail is I would say how is this character frail and why are they that way? So frail from from malnutrition makes sense, but I think there's there's actually a more interesting way you can go. So a mentally frail character, uh, this character who's sort of been been pushed around all their life and maybe they they sort of slink in the back and don't want to get to make a big noise, you know, uh, when when there are important people around or you know is very sort of furtive. Uh, I think all of those things will work. I think this would actually be a pretty interesting character, but probably pretty challenging to play. And you have to be very careful to not sort of get in the way of other stuff that, that's going on. All right, so I changed his name to Bosco instead of Radus because I didn't want to have, you know, two Radices, Radices on there. I think a sort of a rogue character like this would be, actually be pretty interesting. I think my note at the very bottom says he could be like a mastermind of of the downtrodden which i think has its own pretty cool ideas uh depending on how your your dm or gm wanted to, to work that or if this is an npc you could imagine this is someone who sort of pulls the st strings in the background who is who's got this large orchestrated plan but is unassuming to to the authorities which i think actually works very well as an npc maybe less well as a pc yeah i think that i think that's already pretty interesting so I said I was going to stop there, but I'm having so much fun doing these, I decided to do another one. And I basically just clicked random buttons until until I got one that I thought was really interesting to end on. So we have Emma Lyra, the Oathbreaker, who is tenacious, prideful, and motivated by power, status, and ambition, with a twist. So I think, you know, an Oathbreaker is somebody who's probably been exiled or thrown out or is in some kind of trouble. Maybe they've been stripped of their power. Maybe that's, maybe that's the twist. They want their, their power back less than they didn't have it uh, more that they want to get it back. I think maybe they come from a long lineage where they have some sort of ancestral obligation. So maybe it's like the writers of Rohan coming to, to the defense of Gondor or something like that. And maybe they don't believe that they were wrong. Maybe it's sort of a technicality or something like that. And they want to prove that this was, you know, not, not a real thing or prove, maybe they want to prove that they still have value in the world. They still want to prove that they are, you know, uh, this great person, uh, regardless of, of this oath breakerness, oath breakerness. Yeah. English. It's a thing. I think this is already going in a really interesting direction and, uh, I will see what comes up when I write this up. I'll be right back. So now that I've written this stuff all up, and uh, I've had some more time to think about it. I want to note that tenacious and pride are two very, very useful things for us to work with. So tenacity is a thing that will get you through all kinds of terrible things. And pride is a thing that will make you do things that are probably not great uh, just in general. So I see this as sort of uh, Emma Lyra as sort of a, a hot-headed character who will stick to her guns whenever, whenever it comes up and is prideful to the point of making some terrible, terrible decisions and going after some really, really bad things. So if this was a player character of mine, the thing I would ask is like, how, how, how strongly do you believe that you, you have not broken this oath? And I would poke at that. I would poke at that mercilessly until we found out where the, where the edge was. And I think there's a lot of really, really great ideas that, uh, that can come out of that kind of play. I also think that this and could be a character who is maybe prideful in different ways uh, than, than the obvious ones, but the more obvious one is the, the one that I would probably go with if I wasn't entirely sure.
Uh, I think all of these have been pretty cool, and uh, this is a pretty interesting one to end on. So that has all been enormously interesting, and I think it shows some of the power that you can have using these kinds of tables, these kinds of tools. We are not really sure what you're going to come up with, but it's the associations we make, it's the, the stories that we can write about these things, the ways we can push them in different directions to get where we want to go, that is really interesting. Feel free to take this table and copy it and use it and twist it to your own nefarious purposes as, as you see fit. Uh, it is a tool for you to use. And uh, if you do, drop me a line in the doobly-doo and maybe, maybe we can take a look and build something better. But that's enough for one video. Shoo, I'll see you on Sunday.